Good morning, everybody. Welcome. We're delighted to have you here. My name is John Hamry. I'm the president at CSIS. We still have folks coming in, and they'll be filling in the audience while we're, uh, while we're waiting. I wanted to say welcome to all of you, and thank you for coming. This is uh, the first for this year of our uh, Statesman's Laureate series on, in the Brzezinski Institute. I'm very pleased to uh, welcome Nabil Fahmy. I had the privilege of being his student. You know, now this, I was working at CSIS, and it was the first time I had an opportunity to interact with the diplomatic community. He became my mentor. I, I learned more from Nabil than any other diplomat in Washington, and, but I think that that doesn't set me apart. I think that half of the diplomatic corps would say exactly the same thing. This is a man of exceptional experience and intellect and has the capacity to frame both the details that matter, but also put it in a strategic context that becomes invaluable to understanding the forces that are playing out. A remarkable diplomat, a remarkable individual. Uh, obviously, he w left here to become foreign minister, and he was uh, needed for larger things, and now he is retired, but he's hardly uh, retired. He is very active, and so we pleaded with him if he would be willing to come and share with us his insights uh, about the uh, remarkable developments in the Middle East, how we should be thinking about them. I know for myself, I will be guided so much by his perspective as I always have been. So. Can I ask you, with your applause, please welcome Nabil Fahmy, Foreign Minister of Egypt. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And thank you, John, very much. As you can see from John's introduction, he's not only a superior, what? Not only a superior intellect, He's also a much better diplomat in how he presents people than I am. I mean, I couldn't have done that. But uh, to tell you the truth, I gained tremendous knowledge from coming to his breakfasts in my nine years uh, in Washington here and talking about the region. And you were going through a, a, an active role in the me region at the time, and then things were happening also uh, in, in the mid in, uh, here in America. So I want to thank you for, for that, and thank also John Alterman for his friendship for many, many years. Many of you in the crowd I know, so I'm not going to start and uh, recognizing you all because we'll spend the 40 minutes mentioning names, and I don't think you want me to do that. Uh, I've come to you to speak about our region and hopefully help engage in how we work together as, as we move forward. My point of departure is, like the world, the Middle East is going through uh, change. Our change is more fundamental than in other regions. Uh, for particular reasons that I will deal with. But change is occurring, and that has to be our point of departure. So while dealing with the past and the present is important, it's also very important to look forward and see what we do with the future. Over five years have passed now since what we call the Arab Spring or the Arab Awakening started. And it, frankly, took all of us by surprise, although it shouldn't have, because the basic reasons for it had been percolating for well over a decade, if not two. And I will summarize them quickly. First, the extremely substantial and significant demographic change. Population in the Middle East had doubled in, in over three decades. And uh, the youth bulge, in particular, had reached 30% of the population. With that, you saw rapid urbanization, people looking for jobs, following the money, as you would say here. And that wasn't always a uh, rational, uh, systemically managed, well-managed process. And therefore, you saw unemployment increasing, particularly with the well-educated and those who had university graduates. Uh, that is a recipe for people wanting change and for frustration, and people who are educated and know how to create change. So, it shouldn't have been surprising that this was going to happen. The other element that is extremely important, globally but also in our reach, was the communication re revolution. The fact that my grandchildren or everybody I know uh, can get information that they want to get, not through government sources, not through a centralized 
uh, source of information. And they can also connect and contact anybody they want. Uh, this, in effect, broke the monopoly that Middle Eastern states had on providing information, but it also broke the basic tenets of centralized government, which is communication. The, the governments in the region were not changing their management style to deal with a society that wasn't centralized, wasn't going through a pyramid scheme, but was, frankly, moving horizontally. And the results of all of that were two significant, if you want, deficits that I think were uh, extremely important because many of you will say, well, the whole world is changing and technology affects everybody, so why did it create such a mess in the Middle East and why the volatility and, and the violence and so on? Because of these two deficits. The first is the managing change deficit. As I, meant, as I said, uh, you had governmental stagnation, and I'll give you just some examples of it. In the countries where we saw what we call the Arab Spring, all of them republics, the term of office of the four presidents in those countries was between 30 and 40 years, even though they had, were going through election cycles. So you were basically having ruler stagnation. And I don't mean this in a personal sense, but with it you get governance stagnation because the system is repeating itself over and over again. And that created a system where the governance authorities could not cope with the changing landscape that was moving and changing so quickly. The second reason, equally important, but the second deficit, frankly, was what I call a national security deficit, both in the military and political sense. And this is, in essence, a result of Arab states and beyond Arab states in the Middle East, but particularly Arab states, for generations, from the Atlantic to the Levant, down to the Gulf, crossing, of course, my country as well, depending on foreigners for their material, direct national security concerns, in other words, hard security, and or their political security as well. Now again, I can go on and give you a list, but I'll, I'll take my own country as an example because uh, it's, it's uh, something I know well. well. We started off initially trying to move towards the West after 52. The West wasn't particularly interested. We moved very close to the Soviet Union. <coughs> at the time, then shifted back <coughs> towards, towards the West. If you go towards the uh, North Africa, you'll see it was Western Europe mostly and, and the West. Go towards the Levant and you will see it's more Soviet Union. And then you go down to the Gulf and it's completely to the West. That led to a dependency factor which defined and limited their capacity, our capacity, to deal with our own national security issues. And if you look at the, the national security capacities of the non-Arab states in the region, Turkey, Israel, and Iran in particular, you will see that their capacity is higher than any one of the Arab regional states, even though at points in time they had relations, strong relations with a superpower. The other point, frankly, is if you're depending so much on foreigners, then logically speaking, when there's a problem or an opportunity, the priorities, interests, and agendas of foreigners will come into play. You can't then argue it's only a domestic issue. If your stability and your security, your success or your failure, affect somebody else's interest and you've brought him into the game. So, why is what you see in the Levant in particular becoming so complicated with domestic, regional, and international issues all coming to play? Because all of these people are players. Doesn't mean I agree with them or with their policies, but we've made the mistake of bringing them in too far. Now, I'm not an isolationist, and I strongly believe we be, need to be part of the world, and I, I've always promoted Egypt be, reaching out and engaging people. So nobody's calling here for isolationism. But the proper balance between 
what you need and where you complement your interest has to be proper between what you can afford domestically and what you can do regionally, do, uh, regionally or internationally, because otherwise the priorities are mixed. And foreign powers will help you if there's an existential threat or if their interests are directly concerned. And regional powers will, 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 will define their terms depending on where they see the balances and imbalances. So this national security imbalance in actual fact complicated the agendas, but it also led to regional uh, aggressiveness, particularly by the non-Arab states. With these two deficits in play, it shouldn't have been a surprise that what we saw was revolutions rather than evolutions. The natural consequence of the inability to manage change and weaknesses in national security vis-a-vis -vis your neighbors uh, and consequently weakness in policy making. Five years since the Arab awakening, anybody you talk to in the region, the Arab world at least, you will sense a level of frustration. Some feel that dreams were so large and so high, they're frustrated that they haven't been achieved. Others argue that change is so difficult, maybe change is bad and status quo was a better option. And a third group believe that change is a big conspiracy by a lot of people, some of them in the region, but others uh, abroad. Nobody is uh, particularly comfortable. I'm not surprised now, although I have to admit uh, it's been a learning process for all of us. It's very difficult to make the fundamental changes that we want to make over a three, year, three or five year period, especially with the two deficits that I mentioned. The next few years, I think we're going to move forward, but I think it's going to be tenuous, and I think it's, going to, there's going to be ups and downs. I don't think it's going to be a straight uh, uh, line upwards because we are trying to create a new culture, a, a series of new cultures of engagement domestically, regionally, and uh, internationally. Now, I just want to make a point of caution. Don't generalize when you talk about the Arab, Arab Spring or the Arab Awakings. They're not all the same. Each one has a common element, the two deficits. But then some of them, because of the variation in the balance here, are more, dom more domestic, others are more regional, and, and the third party has be have become both domestic, regional, and, and international. The common element, however, the results of this instability, is a huge identity crisis in the region. People are trying to define who they are. That's really what you see in common, even if they speak different variations of Arabic or uh, other ethnic languages. But the, the attempt to define identity is really the, 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 the main challenge. There's tension between modern modernity and revisionism, which people like to call fundamentalism. But should we move forward or move backward is the answer, moving forward or moving backwards. Uh, there's tension between the national identity and the religious identity. Should I'm a practicing Muslim and I'm proud of it, but should I be in, well, I can argue three things, Arab, Egyptian, or Muslim? That's being debated now, less so in Egypt, but mostly throughout the Arab world and a little bit also in Egypt. And there's a third identity among the many about the national identity and the ethnic identity. Am I Arab or am I Kurd? Even if you look at the Iraqi example specifically, when, it, when after Saddam, in the new Iraqi constitution, it talks about Iraq in the Arab world. Because they had so many ethnic constituencies, they wanted to make sure that they didn't exclude anybody by simply saying they were an Arab country. So the issue of the national identity versus the ethnic identity has, is also seriously to play here. Now, with all of that, there is an overarching issue here. If we start defining ourselves differently and consequently develop systems of governance that are different, then, you, then what you really have is a 
direct challenge between the nation state order and the ethnic or non-nation state order. How are you going to define yourself? Is this the Muslim world or is it Muslim states in the Arab world? So, and consequently, what elements do you need to do and how do you define national security uh, and so on and so forth. So I underline this point. You're also seeing, seeing, here, seeing here a very dangerous challenge to the nation state order in the Middle East. And that should not be taken uh, lightly. And I frankly don't see enough focus on that internationally or domestically and regionally. Now, since we don't like to do things easily, uh, and because of the due deficits I mentioned, you also see a l very large number of non-state actors. Let's leave aside the positive ones, civil society, uh, the multinationals, and so on and so forth. I'm talking about mostly our extremists and terrorists. And they are part of the game, trying to feed on the frustrations that exist in the region and or the imbalances and take advantage of that, and ISIS is just one of them, not all, not all of them. My, fi my final two points on this issue of identity and challenges. The region is trying to define what actually is the role of religion in society. It's a much more religious society than many parts of the world. But what actually is that role? Is it simply an issue of faith, or is it faith and culture? or is it faith and politics? And when I use the term role of religion, I don't mean simply political Islam. I actually mean the larger meaning of this, but it includes the issue of political Islam. And my last point, my last point that I think is challenging us all is we need to find a way as we determine our identity, as we, determine, as we deal with the challenges between a nation state and ethnic identities or other identities, we need to find a comfort zone with power sharing. And that, frankly, is not only applicable to the Arab world. That also applies to Israel, Turkey, and Iran. And I can expand on that. But the issue of holding power and sharing it at the same time, it, the region still does not have a comfort zone in, in that respect. Well. <laughs> Where, where, where do we go from here? First thing, anybody who thinks it's going to be fixed quickly should leave the room, <laughs> frankly. It's not. So it's going to, and, and if you really are interested in this and want to make an investment, and it has to be a strategic investment, not something where you think you're going to get some early hanging fruit, which you may, but it's not going to last very long. If you look at the, the Maghrib Arab, Morocco, for example, has done reasonably well in the transition from the father to the son, and, and it's dealt with these issues reasonably well, frankly. Uh, it's not, the story hasn't ended, but I think they've done reasonably well. If you look at Algeria, they had their problems uh, a decade or two ago, and they're, just for natural reasons, clearly going to have a change of leadership over the next uh, decade. So, and one will see whether that will lead to a re-emergence of the old problems or whether that transition is done uh, uh, smoothly. Tunisia, what happened there was in essentially domestic, not regional or international. And we all tend to applaud Tunisia because they've had the ability to find compromises among the different political trends uh, in their country, and it is something that they deserve applause for, frankly. At the same time, the story is ongoing, and what, what, something that's alarming is, if you look at the strength of the Salafi movement in Tunisia, it seems illogical given the secular nature of the country, and they were much more progressive very early on in the region compared, and compared to other Arab countries. And I would add to that, Given the sense of compromise, given the progress that we've seen, why are there so many Tunisians leaving the country going to ISIS? So again, there are larger problems that need to be dealt with, but they're on the right track. So I mean, I, I, I applaud Tunisia for what they've done, but 
you know, one needs to look at these things a bit more deeply because they're not about the symptoms. They're actually about whatever the disease is or the remedies are. Uh, Libya. When I, when I uh, dealt with this, I was trying to figure out what I want, whether I wanted to call it a failed state or a non-state. That's not a, a two good options, frankly, to deal with. But look, for I believe that if one wants to see whether Libya is reversing track and getting back on track to creating uh, a state system, the first test will be, are government authorities being able to exercise authority on land? It won't be about political consensus. It will be, it is such a chaos, there's so much chaos there. <laughs> the first indication that we may be on the road to solving this is can a government body decide, okay, I'm going to police this particular area or I'm going to manage this area. The second, frankly, is the politics. I think it's imperative for the Sirak government and for General or Field Marshal Haftar now uh, in the East to find some political compromise, even if it is gradual. Haftar clearly, with his recent achievements on, in the East, has more political weight than he had in the past. And on the West side, the government exists there, or at least a government exists there. Neither side can show conclusive uh, authority uh, throughout the country. Uh, and we're in the Middle East, not, not, not Egypt per se, but we're all talking about is one side going to lead this or are we going to divide it into east and west? Sorry, is it going to, is it going to be divided into east and west, north and south? Or for that matter, are they going back to the monarchy? I mean, that's the state of play. It's so fluid. People don't know, actually, what the options are. But I would keep my eye on the exercise of authority by the government as a very first step. If you don't have that, then all of this is, frankly, just uh, theoretical discussions. And secondly, is there room for compromise? And there should be between the East and the West. Um, for either of those to occur, an important element here is to try to contain the ability of non-state actors, extremists, and their acquisition of weapons and money. And therefore, I propose, frankly, that unless somebody helps the Libyans do that, it's not going to happen. And I don't see one party taking on that burden alone. So my suggestion is we should create a UN, Arab League, possibly African Union force, not to, not to to manage Libya, but to, manage, to monitor and manage the borders. As a first step to allowing the government authorities to slowly be able to manage what's happening in the inside. And frankly, Algeria, Egypt, and Tunis should naturally play a prominent role here. It does not mean that they should put forces inside Libya. I'm not suggesting that. What I'm suggesting is we need to monitor the borders. And since Algeria, Tunis, and Egypt have long borders with Libya, they are naturally part of this game. And it should be, frankly, a UN, Arab League, African Union force. I was going to skip Egypt, but I didn't think it would be fair to John if I, if I did that. So I, I'll, talk about, uh, Egypt. I'll talk about Egypt for a second. Look, Egypt's going through a, a fundamental socio-political and economic transformation. All of the numbers I gave you are essentially Egyptian, but they apply to the uh, rest of the world. And we're trying to do that at a point in time when all of our borders are on fire or problematic. So it's not, I mean, the Egyptian case was domestic. It was not a regional issue, and it's, it is not today a geopolitical issue either. But for us to be able to solve all of the questions I raised, it's not easy when you look across your border and there's a problem on every side of it. And I would joke frequently when I was foreign minister that my nightmares were more pleasant than my days. First of all, they were shorter and they ended and they weren't real. 
Uh, but that is the problem today. How are we going to, for example, respond to the economic needs or the need for security or the projection of our influence because it's of interest to us in the region? If not only am I trying to define myself domestically, but I also have borders that are on fire all over the place. But again, so this isn't taken lightly and people don't think that, well, there's an easy model to apply here. Let me just give you two anecdotal pizza pieces of information. Between, from 52 to 2011, 60 years, you had four presidents. From 2011 to 2016, we've had four presidents. That in itself shows you the, the amount of change and the different forces being uh, in play here. Now, it's not the whole story, but it's just sort of one easy example of understanding the magnitude of this. We went from a system of long stagnation to now, at least from 11 until 16, uh, and until, until 14 with the elections, to a system where the sense of authority broke down. Everybody had an opinion in Egypt, and that's fine, but everybody exercised the authority, and that's not fine. Uh, that was in a, in a country that in the past, you always knew where the sense of authority was. There was, for decades and decades, we saw an erosion of, of public politics and an emphasis on centralized government. And that shifted, as I said, to a breakdown of authority. And to this day, the, we, ha, we are a pluralistic society, but we need to develop pluralistic political ethics at the same time. And a system that embraces everybody Everybody that's ready to put his nationality as the primary definition uh, of his commitment and to follow uh, the Constitution. Now, as we do this institutional changes, people want to have a better way of life in the immediate sense. And it's very, very difficult, not only because of the political issues, but we have a, an approximately close to 3% population growth rate. And I'm trying to imagine to reach, reach the objectives or the, the, the responses to that kind of group with very strong challenges to many of our direct sources of income because of the five years that have occurred, tourism, uh, exports, um, and frankly, the reduction of world trade. So when we argue that, well, we're growing at 3%, that's better than 0%. But we actually need to grow between 7 to 8 percent for a number of years just to meet demand. And we can't do that by doing, taking traditional steps. It's important for us to take decisions and focus on projects that will give you exponential gains, not simply the traditional uh, incremental gains. And I argue here that I believe that more and more focus has to be done on, uh, on technology, on state-of-the-art technology projects. Now again, let, let's not belittle the, what has been achieved. There has been very significant work done on infrastructure projects. The government has taken very difficult decisions. My, my, I, my professional career, which is quite long, we were always discussing reducing subsidies. Well, they decided to reduce subsidies, at least on energy. And for 35 years, we were discussing and never took, took the step. They put in a new uh, VAT tax. Now, you would argue that what's the VAT tax? It is important because what, what's important in this case not is actually the income from the tax, but it starts defining the informal, informal economy, which is almost equal to the, to the official economy in Egypt. Because the tax, you get the tax benefit incrementally if you participate. So this is, I think, is a very important issue. And Security today is much better than what it was uh, two years ago or, or, or four years ago. There are still problems on the western border with Libya, and there are some problems in certain areas in the Sinai. And um, unless we also deal with that, we won't reach our, our goals. But there is progress. Now, where I think we can do better is as Egypt moves, the government moves from one challenge to the other, it's important to enunciate more clearly what is the political and economic agenda, what's the vision? Not the goals, what's the vision? 
what kind of country are we trying to achieve in so that we can all figure out whether the benefits or the cost to uh, each one of us individually are worth this process. And then also the projects, but I really believe it's important to understand that there are multi-stakeholders now, so it's not enough to send a memo to those who have authority. Everybody has a piece of the authority. So public discourse on vision is extremely important. Uh, I think we've, well, we finished the roadmap. So in other words, we have an elected president, we have an elected parliament, we have a new constitution, and all of those are important steps forward. But we need now to see an active, vibrant political system where all of these bodies are engaged and fulfilling their obligations, while at the same time respecting the separation of powers between one and the other, because that's what will allow the checks and balances to function properly. Um, and I underline this, both the importance of enunciating policy and the separation of powers, because while I was joking about the challenges, they are of such a magnitude that if we don't get political public support for them, it will be very difficult to take the difficult decisions that are required domestically, or for that matter, to regain, to replay our role regionally, in particular, in a region that's on fire, because that will require public support for whether we decide to be active in, in, in the Levant uh, or in, in Sub-Saharan Africa and so on. Uh, if you talk to, to any Egyptian, he will always, and I, I smile at some of you looking up at me, uh, talk to you about the importance of us gaining, regaining our role in the, in the Middle East. And I would tell you the same thing as well. I think it is important, not only because it's something that one's proud of, but also because it actually helps our national interest. It is in Egypt's national interest to preserve the nation state system. We promote ourselves as a nation state, not as leaders of Sunni Islam, Shiite Islam, Yazidis, Kurds, or this or that. Secondly, our leading role the majority of the time was not about material assets. They're always important, but it wasn't about that. It was about being a pioneer in establishing nation state systems, in developing new trends in peace and war, in, develop, in pushing new social concepts. Look, women had the right to vote in Egypt before Switzerland. And people forget that, but that's actually true. Uh, and war and peace in the Middle East was basically defined by Egypt. We need to regain that. And the way we did it in the past wasn't by promoting policy. It was by having a country that others in our region felt was a model that they would like to emulate. We never went around telling them you had to do what we did. But they wanted to have the arts and the sciences uh, and the music and, and, and the education that they found in our system. So the beginning of regaining our role is actually creating for the Egyptian people a 21st century modern society that they are proud of and that others would, be, would want to emulate, not necessarily 100%, but in different uh, forms. Uh, and that's, I think, something that comes very closely with this issue of enunciating uh, policy, domestic and regional. Let me spend a few minutes on uh, foreign policy. Four or five days after I, I came into office, I held a press conference because I believed in the importance of speaking to the people and projected what I thought was the elements of Egypt's new foreign policy. We had two revolutions. What did they say? What was a common word in both of them? Freedom. What does freedom mean in foreign policy? You can either isolate yourself or have multiple choices, it's either or. You can't be a foreign policy player with two, two Cs, importing food and energy and being dependent on national security issues. You can't have one. You can't be free unless you have multiple options. So the first point 
we made then, and it's still the policy today, was we will defend the June 30th revolution. That's point one, because that, that was imminent and urgent. But secondly, it was to ensure that we had freedom of choice in foreign policy. And that's why we did not, and we said this publicly and we say this today, we did not say we want to replace America by Russia or by China or by Japan. It was we wanted to develop relations with America and Russia and China and, and Japan to give us more choices and consequently be a healthier partner for all of, the, all of these. So this point of diversifying your relations is an extremely important point and it remains today a, a, a core issue in Egypt's foreign policy. The second, frankly, was to regain our regional uh, focus. We cannot claim to be the leaders of Latin America. Well, we can, but nobody will believe us. Uh, so seriously speaking, where can we actually have influence and be taken seriously? And where is it a priority for us in our neighborhood? So regaining our foothold in the Arab world and in Africa is extremely important. And we, again, we continue to try uh, to do this. I would like to see in Egypt's foreign policy a wider, clearer explanation of scenarios for the future. What we expect to happen in the future and what, how we would like to deal with it. I think our society is strong enough, healthy enough, and has the depth to engage or at least lead that discussion. It's remained the only country in the region, especially in the Arab world, but in the region generally, that has interests from the Maghreb Arab right through to the Levant down to the Gulf and will comment and has commented regularly on everything from war and peace in our region, climate change, uh, social issues uh, at, at the UN and so on and so forth while most of the countries for understandable reasons started off with priorities that were immediately close to them. So I urge my colleagues back home, and I do this publicly, there's no, there's no secret, that it, we are the only ones who have the ability to put forward options and visions for the future. They don't have to be accepted by anybody, but they should set the, the, the parameters for the discussion as we move forward. And I would like foreigners to look at Egypt that way. And I say this in America in particular, because Americans have tended to look at Egypt for decades, and we have occasionally made that mistake of projecting ourselves in that fashion. As well, Egypt is the country that made peace with us. We are, and we did that for our own national interest, and it still is in our national interest. But there's more to Egypt than that. And there's more things happening in the Middle East than that. So I would argue that Egyptians need to promote themselves as the country that made peace first, but also the country that has influence on A, B, C, and D, and this is how we look at the future. I mean, I remember in my past functions, especially as a diplomat, when we would talk about, to our <coughs> colleagues in the West about the Arab street, they wouldn't even bother to smile or pay attention. Now, even as foreign minister, when I would talk about a new proposal, they would look, well, is the Arab street going to follow you? Nobody really knows what the future is, but we need to be, be the ones leading the discussion about that. Syria. Syria also was originally a domestic issue. It wasn't a geopolitical issue regionally or internationally. Now, it is the worst humanitarian disaster in history, and it has political ramifications that go far beyond the Levant, can influence the shape of the Middle East completely, and with the present tensions between the US and Russia can actually go well beyond that if anybody miscalculates. I would add that I don't see any end in sight. I don't see an end on the battlefield. No battlefield success will bring all the forces together and uh, lead to uh, resolution. At the same time, there are no regional players, Arab or non-Arab, directly or through surrogates, that can resolve this on their own. The superpowers obviously can't solve it on their own. So the logical answer, therefore, is 
if and when, if and when there's a solution, it's going to have to involve the two major powers, at least, Russia and America. It's going to have to involve a number of the regional players, uh, as well as, of course, the Syrians, and not necessarily in that order, but as well as the Syrians. The Syrians can't solve it, the regional players can't solve it, and the foreigners can't solve it. It requires a grand bargain. And I don't see a grand bargain developing in the next six weeks, or for that matter, uh, until you have a new president, possibly a new administration. But this will drag on. I, nevertheless, for the sake of the hundreds that die every week in Syria, or those that uh, move from their homes, I nevertheless would highly recommend, and again I say this back home, even after your elections, before a new president is inaugurated, some quiet diplomacy, feelers on both sides to see, okay, what are the ground rules here, where are we going? It serves nobody, I don't think anybody in America thinks he can solve this alone. And I can tell you from my meetings also with the Russians, they know they can't solve this alone either. And nobody has sort of a magic wand. It's not going to be solved with one proposal on the table. So I would urge all of you, as I do my regional colleagues, let's try to get some quiet diplomacy ongoing until we have a new American president, and then we need to look for a grand bargain. Yemen was also initially a domestic issue. The efforts by the UN emissary are, frankly, the only game in town, and it's not a particularly active game, frankly. Uh, it's become now a domestic issue, a sub-regional issue in the Gulf, and also an issue that involves uh, tensions between the Gulf, Arab Gulf countries and Iran. So, again, it won't be resolved, it, it, w it will only be resolved either if you have a sense of fatigue where the parties feel this is simply costing too much to continue, and therefore let's look for a compromise, or you, get a, you have a rebalance in who has influence and who doesn't have influence in the region, and that can't happen quickly. Uh, therefore, the real issue is the polit political rebalance. I think, and I've said this before, for the Middle East to stabilize, Yemen is just one example, uh, there has to be a serious dialogue between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And there has to be a serious dialogue between Turkey and Egypt. But before you start tweeting, I don't see either of them happening very quickly. And I actually believe that what's necessary is something you Americans used to tell me very frequently, and I would oppose, are some quiet confidence-building steps from the Iranians towards the Arab Gulf states and also from the Turks towards Egypt, and to try to build up a little bit of the deal with the, the, the lack of trust that exists uh, so, over it's, <coughs> so over time we can get into a, a more serious uh, dialogue. Many talk about the Arab Spring, but they forget a major component of the frustration and anger that exists, which, which is the lack of a, Palis of a Palestinian country, a Palestinian state. The lack of resolution of the Palestinian-Israeli track, while quiet on the ground in comparative terms, is only so because there's more blood happening in other areas than in that theater in particular. But it is the longest ongoing conflict, and it will continue to create problems for us in the future if we don't solve this. Personally, I don't see progress, but I don't see a solution except for the two-state solution. Either we find ways to move forward towards a two-state solution, or we are going to end up with a one-state solution. And I don't think a one-state solution will respond to the national aspirations of the parties involved. But it should be, one should be very careful here. We've gotten to the point where, well, you have the choice to make now. 
you want to keep your national aspirations, it has to be in two states. You don't want to engage in that, then you're going to play with demographics. And it will be a one state, but you can't continue to have people under occupation for a century. Now, to get there, I suggest the following. As an interim step until, again, you finish your elections, but that's not the only problem, frankly, on the peace process. So just four points, a package of four points. First of all, I want the Palestinians and the Israelis to announce that they support a two-state solution based on 1967 boundaries or territories, let's put it that way. It's the first element. Because I frankly question whether the support is there, particularly with the present Israeli government. I don't think that the present government in Israel believes in two-state solution. So that's point one. Give me a reaffirmation of the commitment. Point two is let's have direct negotiations between the Israelis and Palestinians. And while they're occurring, security cooperation between Palestinians and Israelis should continue and settlement activities should stop during the negotiations, irrespective of the illegality of settlements or the arguments about settlements, but just as in order to move things forward. Uh, I would hold these direct negotiations under regional auspices with superpower support. Specifically, I would hold them under Egyptian auspices. Our relations with Israel are good. Our relations with the Palestinians are good. But they would have to have an endorsement from America and Russia. They can't be resolved simply with regional support. And I would give them a 12-month term limit maximum. Now, these three points, I would add to them the fourth, which is to make, give this a little bit more sense of purpose. I'd want these four points to be put in a Security Council resolution, simply saying you will have, you're going to negotiate on two-state solution. You will negotiate directly under the auspices of Egypt and Russia and America, and for about 12 months. And in the meantime, while you do that, stop settlements, but continue the security cooperation. And let's get a resolution from the Security Council this would be the basis for what we do the next 12 months and the basis for uh, the next American administration. It's not a solution, but I'm very worried about ignoring this problem for too long and then one will wonder, well, why are they shooting or why are they throwing stones and so on and so forth. Let me uh, close with, with very few points. First of all, again, What's happening in the Middle East is fundamental. And it is very serious and institutional in its composition. It will take time. Don't assume that things can be resolved quickly. You can't ignore it. The region is on the precipice of implosion. But we need to be wise and patient without being complacent. We cannot afford apathy or complacency. I would urge Arab countries to remain true to their culture, their relationships, and their heritage. I would nevertheless urge them to look forward rather than backwards, take a larger role in defining their own destiny, particularly on the management of their societies and on national security issues, and it is imperative for the leaders in the Arab world to put forward models for 21st century centrist, pluralistic Arab states with strong national security capabilities that deal with the threats for tomorrow. You won't be surprised that I would emphasize and reiterate that I think Egypt can play and should play a prominent role in this respect. I would urge the United States, since I'm here, and again, when I go to Russia, I say similar things, but of a different nature, but they're the same. I would urge the United States to adopt a three-dimensional policy in the Middle East. First, you should embrace a strategic approach, not a tactical one. These issues won't be solved tactically. So you need to embrace a strategic uh, uh, policy 
one that is focused on enhancing the domestic and regional capacity of your friends and allies so that they can play a larger role in their own future while at the same time providing the necessary support for existential threats or major challenges. Long-term capacity building should be the doctrine that you embrace in the Middle East rather than quick fixes or immediate returns because they won't have a lot of uh, shelf life on the, uh, wherever you want to keep them. Secondly, to everybody, Arab, U.S., and internationally, we need to keep our eye on the nation-state system. If we allow the system to break down, because it's easier, let's, okay, let's divide Syria into three sectors, let's divide Libya into three sectors, they're more manageable. Well, they're different anyway. They are different, but they are part of one country. And I would argue that the African Union, one example, in its founding document, basically and correctly blamed Europe for the colonization and, and all of that, but took the position that in spite of all of these failures and faults, it is more dangerous to try to redefine borders and redefine the nation state system than it is to move forward and look towards the future. So again, I underline, while the World War I conspiracies were conspiracies, you've all admitted to that, I don't think trying to dismantle the world is the best way to move forward. And it won't stop in the Middle East, by the way, if you start, if you start doing that. Uh, let me stop with, with, with uh, those points. And I'm open to any questions. Thank you very much. Professor Fahmy, thank you very much for those very thoughtful and wide-ranging comments. I'm John Alterman. I, uh, I'm a senior vice president. I direct the Middle East program, and I also have the Brzezinski Chair in Global Security and Geostrategy here at CSIS. Um, as, as we contemplate very quickly going to the audience, I just want to, to pick up on the idea you expressed about Egypt being the model and Egypt being the kind of place people would want to come. You described a much more decentralized world, a much more decentralized Arab world, uh, where old patterns of governance don't work as well. But Egypt has had centralized governance for a very long time. People have said it comes down to the need for irrigation in Egypt dating back to the pharaohs. How do you think Egypt now has to think about decentralization to become the governance model the economic model for the rest of the Arab world? Well, let me start by saying I think it's important that we all admit, including Egypt, but all of us, that decentralization is occurring. The issue is, is it occurring in a managed fashion or not? The fact that anybody in the street today can convey information and therefore affect uh, public opinion is decentralization of information. So I think we have to go beyond the idea that we can prevent multi-stakeholders. Egypt is a large country with big problems, so there will have to be, and I support this, a strong government. But it's the management of governance, not the form of governing. We have repeatedly talked about decentralizing municipal authorities in Egypt. We have repeatedly talked about giving more authority to governors locally. Uh, and frankly, I think that's the way to go. Now, uh, so my response to that is one, everybody should stop assuming that they can prevent decentralization. You can't. So let's manage it in a proper fashion. Um, and it's going to take time. I mean, the, we have some laws on the books in Egypt that go back almost as long as America exists, frankly. So it's not going to happen overnight. And that's why I said, let's be wise and be patient, but let's not be complacent or apathetic. Thank you. We have some microphones. If you just wait for the microphone, the lady over here. 
Thank you. First of all, thank you. This was a, a fascinating talk, and we all learned from it. My name is Mindy Reiser. I'm vice president of an NGO called Global Peace Services. I don't need to tell you that economic issues have been one of the triggers of, of the Arab Spring and the concern of young people that the future looks bleak. Shimon Peres, who I'm sure you knew in your long career, had a vision of technological sharing among some of the countries in the region. Of course, that would be Egypt. Where do you see the economic power in the coming years, the future for young people? What are some of the creative initiatives going on to give them a sense of investment in their future and in the growth and strength of Egypt? That's an excellent point. The Egyptian government has put a lot of emphasis on implementing projects. And frankly, it's an, it's an executive government. They want to get things done. They don't really want to talk a lot about it. And you see this in the very large uh, amount of transportation changes that have occurred on, in the roadways, uh, what they've done around the Suez Canal, and so on and so forth. That's all good. What I'm talking about is I'm trying to find a way to couple that in other words, building a larger economy. If you listen to President Sisi, he will repeatedly tell you, I need to build a larger economy in order to satisfy the aspirations of my people. And that's correct. The point I add to that is, while we do that, because we've gone through political change in the Middle East, it's important to make sure that everybody feels they're a stakeholder in this process. And therefore, as you take the right steps in implementing projects, we also need to develop a culture of public uh, engagement in politics and the ability to have different points of view as long as they're within the constitution of the, of the country. So it's a challenge. And, and uh, just today, they, I was on watching television in, in Egypt, and they were showing these six tunnels that they had built from uh, across the Suez, under the Suez Canal. All of them were, I mean, the, the general manager of one of the tunnels was 32 years old. You couldn't do that in Egypt five years ago. So yes, we need to respond to youth in particular, and we need to get some real work done. It can't be all talk, but again, talk is important in order to provide direction. We have time for one more question, if there is one. Yes, sir, in the back. Hi, my name's uh, Benjamin Rogers from uh, AJC American Jewish Committee. Um, I wanted to go back to um, when you're talking about uh, the identity crisis in the Arab world. Uh, when you're particularly modernity versus tradition and national identity versus religion. Can you talk, at least in Egypt, how that has altered since the start of the uh, Arab Spring, where we are now? How would you, you uh, gauge where Egyptian kind of understanding on, on this issue is? I mean, this is an issue that's been going on for, for 200 years plus, but uh, I would be interested in your, in your thoughts on that. It's a great question. If I had an answer, I wouldn't have raised them because then it wouldn't be an issue. But it's, the question's valid, but I'll give you an example of, of why I raised it. In 2011 and 2013, you would hear people of my age talk about what the, what the youth did and what they want. 2000, year 2000 or 2005, you would have heard the same people saying what the youth should do in following our direction. So there is a clear understanding today that we're going in a different direction, that the younger generation are going to define success or failure. It's our role simply to provide them an opportunity to do that. And that's why, again, people will say, well, you keep talking about public policy and, and, and putting forward scenarios. Well, young kids, I made mistakes when I was young, and I succeeded in, in, in different things. I want to be able to provide them different opportunities, different scenarios, and the ability uh, and, and, and uh, give them direction, but it, ultimately it will be their choice. I am worried that with the frustrations that exist in the Middle East today, be they the deficits or the frustrations, and the different challenges, they w may be driven towards extremism. So it's, that's why there is this role for an enunciation of public policy, but it's also important, as, as you had said, it can't be all hot air. It needs to have some concrete evidence as well. Uh, last question right here in the front. 
Uh, uh, thank you, Hanif and Dr. Clinton Group. Uh, welcome, Nabil. Uh, I was wondering about the uh, regional fragmentation that you spoke about. Um, in uh, the last uh, decade or so, the center of gravity of the Arab world has moved from the traditional <coughs> centers of Cairo and Baghdad and Damascus into mostly the Gulf region, which has been able to maintain a certain amount of power through economic means. Uh, they had the resources to, to do that. Uh, some in positive ways, some in negative ways, like Yemen, Syria, things of that type. Uh, my question is that now that the Gulf region's money is drying out and it's, it's uh, d declining, uh, where is the center of gravity <laughs> going to shift? Is it going to shift back to Egypt? And with Egypt being in a relatively weak position, how will it maintain that kind of uh, uh, force? In centers of gravity, are not theoretical, they're real, it's, it's a real effect. So if you don't play a role, if you don't create something on the ground, it will shift somewhere else. And that's exactly why what, what you said, and it shifted in a certain area to, to the Gulf. I'm not sure their money is drying up, but anyway, I understand what the point you're, you're making. Uh, where it will go will be defined by, on, by what we do. We can't argue. I mean, when the Arab League was established, in Cairo. There were six countries. We were the ones helping Arab countries get out from under European colonialism. But because we did that, we then had more stakeholders and more shareholders in the Arab system. So it's quite logical that the Arab system becomes more complicated to deal with because there are now 22 rather than six members. Well, nobody's going to give us back our role. You need to gain it. And it should not be the same role we had in the 50s, but it should be a role that's consistent with multi-stakeholders, but multi-stakeholders with some leadership. So I, again, when, when I have these debates back home, I look at my Egyptian colleagues and say, let's get our work done. And then if we do something that's good enough, others will logically want to, to, to emulate these parts of it. If we don't, then there's, it's a moot point anyway because you can't regain your role. I mean, we can gain, let me be careful here, we can gain our role positively or negatively. I prefer to see Egypt as a centrist, moderate society, and that our role is positive. If we want to regain our role because we're at the beginning of the end, that's a different uh, scenario, but it's not one that I want to contemplate on, frankly. Uh, I will try to exercise my own leadership in, in leading the group, thanking you for that excellent you. presentation. Thank you. Thank you, John.